the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh, it's Science Tonight. Now here's your host, Chris Smith. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the show. This is Science Tonight, and I am your host, Chris Smith. I work at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in downtown Raleigh. And oh, live no, with the oh, North Carolina oh, Museum of Natural oh, Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh, it's Science Tonight. Now here's your host, Chris Smith. Hey, everybody. It's great to be with you tonight on Science Tonight. Listen, we've got a great program for you. I promise it's going to be great. We're going to have fun. We're going to learn something new. That's what we do here every week at Science Tonight, every Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern. So thanks for being here. Uh, if you're watching the show on YouTube or on Facebook, jump into the chat box or into the comments. Let me know. We'll drop a little waving hands emoji or just say hi. Let me know where you're watching from. Uh, or maybe how you found the program. That's always good for me to know, too. But I'm glad that you're all here, ready to learn something new with me anyway. So uh, tonight, we are going to be sort of going on a field trip, at least a little bit. Uh, I know that over the last several months, I have been uh, very much wanting to travel, see a little bit of the world, see a little bit more than the inside of the uh, work from home museum studio that I've got right here. And tonight we're gonna take a trip in a way to Ecuador. Yes, we are headed to South America to the edge of the Amazon and the edge of the Andes Mountains with tonight's guest, Dr. Brian Arbogast. Brian is a professor of biology at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington in the department of biology and marine biology. He is also the assistant director at the Wild Sumaco Biological Research Station at the Sumaco Volcano in Ecuador. Brian, welcome to the program. Thank you, Chris. It's really nice to be here. I've been looking yeah, forward to this. Glad for to have a you while. on the show. I'm really excited to learn a little bit more ab about uh, this volcano the research that you're doing and some of the interesting things that you're learning about the wildlife of these two seemingly very different types of ecosystems and environments. Seems like interesting stuff. Yes, well, uh, let me show you where Sumaco uh, Volcano is to start out. Um, here's a map of Ecuador outlined in red. It's a little hard to see, but you can see the white part of the Andes mountain chain running down through the middle of Ecuador. And Samaco volcano is right there at the eastern edge of the Andes. And that's right on the western edge of the Amazon basin. And this is what Samaku Volcano okay. looks like. So this is from looking that at- That is beautiful. Well, thank you, yes, it's a wonderful, fantastic place. Um, this is from about 5,000 feet in elevation, this picture. And it, that's where the field station is. And you're looking up at the peak of Samaku Volcano and it's about 13,000 feet in elevation. And it's relatively pristine, which is one of the things that makes it so wonderful to work there. And before we started working there, there was little previous scientific study of the kind of, uh, of research that I'm gonna talk about tonight. Okay, well, absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, I, I'm glad you brought a map because I was going to ask you sort of where exactly in Ecuador we were going to be headed tonight. Um, yeah, so, so maybe, Brian, we should easier. actually just, uh, you know what, let's, let's jump right into the science because now, now we've whetted everybody's appetite for a little bit of Sumaco Volcano after looking at some of these gorgeous pictures. So uh, you, you shared with us where it is on the map. 
and uh, a little bit about the, the elevation. Tell us a little bit about working in Ecuador at Sumaco Volcano. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. Um, let me go here real quick. Um, it is a, a really amazing place to work. The biodiversity is incredible. It's considered the tropical Andes biodiversity hotspot. So it's really uh, amazingly high in biodiversity for all kinds of organisms, not just mammals. The birds are amazing there. Um, and that's one of the reasons that uh, the Wild Sumaco Sanctuary and the Lodge, which, uh, which caters to international birders, was uh, set up there by Jim and Bonnie Olson and Jonas Nielsen. And um, it's been, uh, there's been a lot of amphibians and reptile uh, work there that have shown that there's quite a few new species that have been described there. Um, on the sanctuary, there's over 530 species of birds and 40, 43 oh, wow. honey, hummingbirds, just hummingbirds, 43. We, we have basically one in Eastern North America. There's 43 that have been documented just at Wild Samaco. Oh, so it's impressive. pretty, uh, for, for a biologist, it's pretty much heaven. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's sensory heaven in terms of the, the animals that live there. Yeah, and job security, right? <laughs> I mean, there's new species to describe every day. There, there's there's so many lifetimes worth of work to be done there that we actually have trouble getting enough people to come down to do work uh, because there's so much work that needs to be done. So you mentioned birds, reptiles, amphibians. Uh, what animals are you studying at Sumaco Volcano? So my colleagues and I and students are mostly uh, studying the medium to large mammals using a uh, technique known as, known as camera trapping, where we use remote wildlife cameras. And we're able to get pictures of very, normally very elusive animals that you never see. And we're able to document them and where they occur. And so here we have a picture, for example, from one of our camera traps of a jaguar. And you can see at the top, it has the date, it has the time, it also tells you the moon phase and the temperature. And we can put all those data together. We, we know where all the camera traps are, so we can actually sort of make a map of where all the different mammals are moving around at any given time by looking at these images. Another, another picture of this, this magnificent jaguar. So uh, oh, that is that's most gorgeous. Of that's most of what we're studying. Yeah, just just and it's like every time you go through the camera trap photos, it's like Christmas morning. And here we have a mountain tapir, which is one of the most endangered uh, large mammals in the world. There's only thought to be about two thousand of the of them left in the wild. Only two thousand. Only two thousand. And we're getting them on Samaka Volcano. And they, they are the smallest, and they are hairy. They're furry. They almost look like an Ice Age mammal. And this critter is a bush dog, which looks like a little bear. It weighs about 10 pounds. That's all. They're tiny. Oh, my goodness. They usually, they usually are so in It's groups. like the size of a house cat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they look like little bears, but they're actually canids. They're members of the dog family. And they're called bush dogs. And they're, they're thought to be quintessentially Amazonian lowland species. But we get them up on the volcano, not just at Wild Samaco at about 5,000 feet, but we've got them up closer to 10,000 feet up on the volcano. I'm not sure what they're doing up there, but they're up there. <laughs> and, okay, and this beautiful cat is a, a, a margay 
Margay is related to an ocelot. They're a little smaller and more arboreal, so they're sort of tree specialist. And they're one of the few cats that can rotate their hind feet backwards so that they can come down a tree head first. And so they don't get stuck in a tree like a oh. house cat would. So wow, those are that's a cool adaptation those, on a cat. Yeah, it makes them incredibly good arboreal predators. Um, it opens that up to them, and it probably allows them a niche that the larger ocelot can't utilize quite as well because they can't they can't climb quite as well. So, um, and we have uh, documented the the highest density of margays anywhere in the literature at Wild Samaco for some reason. We're not really sure why they, are, they do so well there. But um, we had a, a really cool paper that we were able to tell all the individuals that were living on the sanctuary apart by their spots. And, um, you know, I get a good idea of how many males and females and juveniles and so on and estimate their density and it came out to be the highest that we could find anywhere. So the, the Margays is sort of the flagship for Wild Samako, um, kind of our poster child, um, because it was also one of the very first things that we got on our camera traps. We put some camera traps out there in I think 2009, and we thought, well, we will leave them out there for a week and then we'll go check them and maybe we'll have something. Well, we got very impatient and we decided to go look after about a day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, we had Margay, a Margay on the camera. And so that really whet everybody's appetite for uh, keep doing camera trapping at Wild Samako. And it sort of you know, kicked off this whole research program to really try to use this technology to uh, document uh, not just what mammals are living on the volcano, but at what elevations they occur. And are there different communities at different elevations that change sort of as the vegetation changes as you move up the mountain? Okay, so you've got an incredible diversity of species. You've got this unique habitat, this volcano, which gives you all of this elevation shift. But it's also a lot of elevation shift, uh, not where there is any other elevation change in the area, right? Like Sumaco is is off to the west of the Andes, but it's east, excuse me, west of the Amazon and east of most of the, the Andes mountain chains. So all of that rolled in together just means, well, well you said it. You get a biodiversity hotspot. You get unique communities. And you get unique places. How did exactly. you actually get started? How did you get started working at Sumaco? Like, how do you even come to find a place like this? It, it, that's a great question. Um, it was largely uh, serendipity. Um, my good friend and the director of the Wild Sumaco Biological Station, Travis Knowles, who is at Francis Marion University, um, who is uh, one of the lead partners in Wild Samaco Biological Station along with UNC Wilmington. Um, he met Jim and Bonnie Olson and Jonas Nielsen on a birding trip in Peru um, about 15 years ago. And they told them him that they were thinking about making this sanctuary and, and purchasing this land in Ecuador on this Samaco volcano. And they invited him to come down. And about that time, I had come to UNC Wilmington, uh, which is only about two hours away from Francis Marion. And I was getting in touch with Travis Knowles and uh, you know, looking for new projects. And he said, come down to this place in Ecuador with me. And uh, I did, and uh, that's how I got involved. And within about three years, we had opened the, the biological station at Wild Samaco 
um, with, of course, the great help of, of uh, Jim and Bonnie and Jonas, the owners. Um, they've been huge supporters of us. Our institutions have been huge supporters of this idea. And uh, now we have this wonderful biological station there that is the headquarters for a lot of this work. And it's just only a half a kilometer away from the Wild Samako Lodge. So we have a lot of interaction with them as well. Um, so it was all just a lot of vision from, uh, from the owners and uh, just their generosity in, in helping us, helping us um, to uh, get this established. Oh wow! Okay, well, that is that is really cool. Then how how things like that just kind of come together and happen, and you get some you've got the the camera trapping skills, and and somebody else is working in the space already, and and excited to do that. I will say the birding community is phenomenal. If you get to know birding community people, they're great, and they love biodiversity research. Makes sense; those thing two things go together. But I'm, I'm, maybe I shouldn't be surprised that they would also support uh, mammal studies in addition to all of the other biodiversity research that's going on. But that's well, great. Well, you know, they're just, they're, they, they are all very good naturalists and just very interested and curious about the natural world. And from the very beginning, they were sort of thinking about this idea that there would be a research component that would happen there. And it just so happened that things fell into place that we were able to raise money for, for the, the first phase of the biological station and, and, and get it built. And uh, we've been taking classes down there for since 2012 and doing research from there since, since we, well, research since before then, but it's been sort of the, the headquarters um, of where we stay and, and work out of for the for the last almost ten years now. I'm I'm thinking I know the answer to this one. Is Sumaco volcano an active volcano? Technically, yes. Um, the last time that okay. it went off was about 1900, 1895, around there. Um, so from that perspective, it hasn't okay. been very long. You don't see smoke coming out of it or anything like that, but it hasn't been that long since it, it erupted. Let's keep those camera traps rolling then. You never know what you might catch. That's right. <laughs> if you can get the camera trap back. Uh, so That's so I'm right. curious about the camera trapping, uh, how that works, how you set up uh, enough of these cameras to actually get the the kinds of data that you need to learn about this environment. Uh, even like I've seen them at the Museum of Natural Sciences, we have a resident camera trapping expert ourselves, uh, Dr. Roland Kays, and you know he's putting these sort of big these box boxy things out all over the forests of you know North Carolina and the Southeast and and a few around the world too. Uh, is that pretty similar to what you're doing? It sounds like it is. Yes, and so we put out generally maybe 20 to 30 um, camera traps at a time, often on game trails or, or other trails because the animals tend to use those. And we check them um, about every three weeks um, because that's sort of how long an interval, an interval they can go with the batteries and and the memory cards and so on. Although that's that technology is also getting to the point where you can go longer, but we like to check them about every three or four weeks because then we know if they're not working or something like that. But it's the same principle, um, and the cameras are just uh, some of the same ones that that hunters use. Um, sometimes we use a little bit higher grade of camera for the research, but you don't necessarily have to. Um, and so uh, we've used a lot of different models. The, the hardest part about using them 
at Samako, especially in the cloud forest part, is they get so wet, that environment's so wet that it, it tends to fry the cameras uh, pretty readily so they don't last that long. Uh, but, but the way we do it, you know, we have our methodologies for how we space them and so on. But uh, the, the technology is not fundamentally different than what uh, you would buy if you, you know, bought a camera trap off of, of uh, the internet or, you know, at a sports store. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. How, about how big are they? Like, would so, they be noticed so this, by a Jaguar wandering by? That's a good question. This is the size that we're using now. They're quite small. Uh, when we started okay. out, they were probably three times this big. Um, this isn't a whole lot bigger than a deck of cards. And so uh, they um, it's nice that they've gotten smaller because we can put them out a little bit easier and more carry more of them. Um, and uh, yeah, so, the, so they're, they're actually quite small. And that's nice. I imagine too, as they've gotten smaller uh, and better, maybe the price has gone down on them too. You can buy more of them now than you used to be able to. Yes, the the it, in the beginning we we would buy the the top level research brands all the time, and they were significantly better than the cheaper ones. Now it it the the disparity between the really expensive ones and the ones that are maybe a two hundred dollars instead of five hundred dollars, there there isn't much difference in the quality, and that's allowed us to to buy more cameras for the same price. So it's kind of like with computer computers and so on um, in that respect. Right, right. Good, good for science department budgets. Well, so then what yeah. are you seeing on the camera traps? I mean, we saw a, a few of the pictures of a few of the animals, jaguars, margay, tapir, the bush dog. But uh, what are you learning about these animal communities at the volcano so from camera trapping? That's a really good question. Um, what we've really been trying to understand is uh, the, the stratification of the different communities of mammals. What mammals are coexisting with each other at certain elevations? And, you know, uh, where do certain species occur together and where don't they occur together? And so that's what we've really been focused on. Um, and so doing that, we have uh, done a lot of camera trapping at Wild Samaco, but also set up elevational transects for uh, camera trap studies at different elevations as you go up the volcano. And then we put that together into sort of a, a, a presence absence plot, and that can give us a window into uh, what's happening um, with the mammal communities at different elevations along, along the gradient that goes essentially from sort of montane rainforest at Wild Samaco up through the cloud forest, higher up on the volcano. So do you find anything um, out of place? Yeah, yes, and, and uh, a lot that's probably one of the most surprising things is the number of species that we have have new elevational records for that are occurring much higher on Samaco than they had ever been recorded before in Ecuador and in general. So we get things that, you know, in, in, in the, the literature will say, you know, they only go up to maybe 1200 meters and we'll find them much higher than that. And we don't know if that's because of this, this unique location of Sumaco with its, with its close connection to the Amazon basin and the fact that there's still some good vegetation that connects the Amazon to the cloud forest, or if um, this is something that might be happening in some of the other uh, 
some of the other mountains that are sort of on the edge as well. There aren't too many mountains that are similar to, to Samako. So this may be something that's unique to Samako, but um, most of the other ones that are, that are similar have not been studied. They're remote and they have not been studied. So we don't really know how, 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 uh, how widespread this phenomenon might be. Okay. So would you All like right. to see a few so of the other you have to for... that I was about to ask you, like, what are some of the critters that you see, for example, in a, in a cloud forest environment that you're finding? Yeah. Well, let... So yeah, let me show let's, you. A few let's of... see some critters. Let me just zoom forward on some of these then. Um, uh, let's see, we talked about the Margays and Ocelots. Um, this is actually at uh, a, a species that occurs all at all elevations on Smako. It's the puma. And it's what we typically call mountain lion. But it's widespread through South America as well. And we find it at all the elevations where we study. Um, and this is a particularly impressive one. And this photograph was taken right at Wild Samaco. Um, another species that, that we find um, at Wild Samaco is a relative of the puma called the Jagarundi. These are a lot smaller, maybe around 25 pounds. They have short legs. I sort of think of them as these little wiener pumas, but um, they are very <laughs> elusive um, and, and super cool, but really hard to get good pictures of. Um, but that's that's a, a, a Jagarundi. Do you have a photo that you can uh, put on screen for us? Oh, can you see it there? Can you not see it? Oh, no, I'm not seeing it right now. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me see here. Uh, something happened with the sharing. We want to see the Jagaroon D. Okay, can you see it now? The Puma? Yes. Okay, so here's the oh, Puma. Oh, yeah, I know that face. Okay, and here's the Jagaroon D. Oh, wow. So they're dark in coloration and they're, unlike most of the cats, they actually are diurnal. They're out in the day uh, rather than being nocturnal. We also get some really oh, cool okay. weasel, members of the weasel family, like this greater grisson, beautiful weasel, and these big tropical weasels called tyras. And then if we, you were talking about the cloud forest, oh, oh, sorry, I need to say quickly that just recently, relatively recently, we started getting the jaguars up at Wild Samaco that we talked about earlier and the bush dogs. And this is actually a zoo picture of a bush dog I wanted to show you because they're actually really cute and fluffy um, and more so than our pictures showed. But these are, the, again, the ones that are like 10 pounds, these, these little members of the dog family. And Aren't I just precious. wanted to point out that there's, there's about 28 species of non-marine mammal carnivores, members of the order Carnivora, in all of Ecuador. And just at Wild Samaco, we've documented 43% of those, 12 of the species and about 25 species on our camera traps of medium to large mammals. That doesn't occur, doesn't uh, include things like monkeys and things that are in the trees. These are all terrestrial things for the most part. But you asked about the cloud forest. So I wanted to show a few mm -hmm. things from the cloud forest. So we're moving up onto the mountain and I'll skip that. And this is another member of the cat family called an Ancia, which is related to the ocelots and the margays, but is even smaller. And I've got a little video and you can see how wet and damp it is up in the cloud forest. So this is a really cool animal. 
Uh, spectacle bears are up in the cloud for us. These are one of my favorite animals. They also are they're considered vulnerable, maybe 10 to 15,000 of those in the Andes, named because they have these white, typically have this white uh, kind of uh, spectacle coloration on their face. It varies a lot as to how extensive that is, but they're about the size of a North American black bear, but they're not really that closely related to a North American black bear. Sorry, these are a little bit fuzzy, but I wanted you to see the, the spectacles. And then the mountain tapir. <laughs> they, these are just great. They're, they're so uh, uh, they're so unusual and, and so sort of ice age uh, in, a, in a lot of ways because they're furry and so on. And uh, this is a nice series of photos that we made into a little video to give you an idea of what they look like. Again, only about 2,000 of these thought to be left in the wild. And they are, they're pretty big. I mean, big. that's so amazing they're that they're... Go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, it's so amazing that there's, there's not that many of them remaining, but you're still capturing them in your cameras um, and also that they seem to just, they just have great faces for camera. Like you said, yes. this ice age look, the, the, the little prehensile face, that's just a great critter right there. Yes, they really are. They're just, you know, and, and uh, they're the only member, there are four species of tapirs. They're the only ones that don't live in really typical tropical rainforest. They live in this much cooler, wetter cloud forest. All the rest of them t live in lowland areas. And um, let me skip real quick. This is really cool. I wanted to show you this because we haven't spread this too much, but it's kind of fascinating. We know that they also are um, having young up there because here goes a mother with the young one. Oh. So. Well, that's just that great. Also fascinating that we could get this, but also that we have this knowledge now that they not only are up there, but at least a few of them are breeding, right? So that yeah, was, that that's was amazing. a really fascinating thing. And then this is one that I wanted to surprise you with. Um, it is this animal. Oh, okay. And it is a small, quite small, very dark cat. Um, probably definitely in that same genus with the Oncea and the Margay and the Ocelot. But it is not colored like any of them. And its proportions are okay. a bit off compared to, to an Oncea, for example. So mm -hmm. this really surprised us. This is up high up. This is, you know, up at 2,500 to 2,800 meters on the volcano. This is a small cat, probably around five pounds. And we're not sure what it is. Um, it may be just a, an odd color form of an Oncea. That may be the most mm -hmm. likely thing, but it could be something that has not been described too. And I wanted wow. to share that with folks because that's the kind of, uh, you know, amazing things that you can find when you take these camera traps to these really unexplored remote areas like Samaco. Oh, my goodness. That's amazing. It's a, it's a beautiful cat, what, whatever it is. And you can see it has some faint markings on it. Um, but uh, we've not seen any other... Uh, we get normal on seas that look spotted and look very much like miniature margays. And these just, you know, they, they look quite different, even though they, they, they may indeed be, you know, an odd color form of an on sea, but um, we're just not sure at this point. And so we're, we're excited to, to do more work although it's very challenging to do work up at the cloud forest. It takes a couple of days of hiking 
and dragging equipment up there uh, to do the work. And so um, it's very labor intensive and, and fairly expensive to do. But um, we, are, we are chomping at the bit to do more work up at this elevation to try to see if we can figure out what this animal is. But for I'm, now, it's a question. I'm looking forward to that analysis. <laughs> Me too. And when, the last thing I'll yeah, say when you when you publish the paper describing a new species of wildcat on Sumaco, we'll have to have you back on the show to tell us all about this new wildcat. Okay, that that's a deal. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll just sort of we were talking a little bit about the elevational structuring, and I'll just say that this is a this is a plot showing uh, if it's dark gray, then the animal was documented at that elevation, and it goes. From left to right, it goes from the rainforest at Wild Samaco up into the cloud forest at increasingly high uh, elevations. And uh, you can see that some of the species only occur down around the Samaco level in that left-hand column. But you see other ones that occur higher up and also ones that only occur high up. What we decided to do to sort of get insights into this was Oh, and this is where the, the transition is. This red dash line is the transition between the rainforest at Wild Samaco and the, the cloud forest. So if it's to the right, it's up in the cloud forest. If it's to the right of this red dash line, if it's to the left of this red dash line, it's down at Wild Samaco in the rainforest. But we color coded it by taking species that generally occur at all elevations, those that are really Amazonian lowland species typically, and those that are typical Andean species like the spectacled bear and the mountain tapir. And when we color coded these and mapped them out, we got this. And what's significant about this is that you'll notice the high number of Amazonian species in green, light green, that occur well to the right or higher up in the cloud forest but if you look at those Andean species in blue, they never occur below the cloud forest or even close to the ecotone where it switches to the rainforest. And so we've been sort of calling this phenomenon, this Amazonian creep, where either it's active or it's been like this for a while and we just didn't know, but a lot of these Amazonian species are occurring well up into the cloud forest, much higher than we would have predicted at Samaco. So that's sort of the main take home point of, of uh, where we're at in terms of this elevational structuring. Lots of Amazonian species are found higher in elevation on Samaco than we ever would have expected before, but we never see the opposite. We never see Andean species occurring at lower elevations than expected. And that could have some conservation implications because there isn't a lot of cloud forest habitat because of the shape of the volcano. Um, it, it sort of, you only have it between 1600 meters and 3000 meters and it's pyramid shape. You don't have as much cloud forest at Samaco. And if a lot of these Andean species are pushing their way up um, if that has negative consequences on the cloud forest species, that could be problematic for them. And that includes species like the mountain tapir, the spectacled bear, um, a few other species, and you know potentially these, the, the spotted cat and so on. Right, right, right. So, well, okay, so that leads me into what's going to be uh, probably my last question, and then I'm going to turn it over to our audience members. So, folks, if you got questions about Sumaco Volcano, Ecuador, the carnivores, the other critters that live there, uh, or the research that Brian's got going on at Wild Sumaco, go ahead, start dropping your comments into the chat. That way we can get them queued up and ask them live here on the show. So, get to it, folks. And so, Brian, that was going to be my sort of final question is 
what are the not just the conservation implications of the work that you've done, but also what is being done to protect these areas and these species, some of which you indicated are uh, vulnerable to extinction? Well, one of the great things is that uh, from about 1,600 meters up to the top of Samako is Samako National Park. And it has been protected for a while and it's being protected. Access to it is only a single trail that is hard to, to, to really climb. And uh, so it doesn't get a ton of visitors. It's kind of off the beaten path. So from that perspective, conservation is pretty good for the cloud forest species. Um, that's okay, that's wow. the, good, the good news about it. Now, one of the things we worry about a, a bit is climate change and how that might affect it, right? And so if climate would, you know, could potentially cause a decrease in the amount of cloud forest cover um, that is on the mountain, if you had warmer temperatures and you had sort of uh, the lower elevation rainforest moving up and displacing some of the cloud forest. Eventually there would be no more mountain for the cloud forest to be on. It would just sort of get shoved off the top, right? Sort of, you know, uh, figuratively right, right. speaking. But but what what is there is protected. The cloud forest part especially is protected. So that's a really good thing, especially given what we found there. Well, all right. Well, that's that's great to hear. Then, that's really great to hear. Although, although maybe not so great if, if hiking up the cloud forest to uh, to put camera traps is is that strenuous every time you have to go do it. Is that what graduate students are for? Absolutely, absolutely. And they are they have been, <laughs> uh, they they have been uh, incredible troopers at doing this um, because it's 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 really difficult work even for people that are super fit to carry all that stuff and, and do that climb is, is really tough. And we've had some incredibly good field as assistance as well. Um, and I wanted to point out too that um, this is not something that just a few of us uh, do. Um, it is something that takes an entire team of people to do and I don't know if you can see that, but these are just most of the folks. I might have missed a few, and I'm apologize if I did. But just some of the team that oh, try sharing uh, has again. made this. Try sharing again, okay. This some of the folks that um, let me try again. Yeah, it didn't didn't take, did it? That work. Yes, yes, perfect. Yeah, so all these people have contributed in some way or another to this work, whether it's from actually putting camera traps out to helping us with permits, uh, to analyzing data and so on. And that's the kind of teamwork it takes to even be able to do this kind of work. It's not just a couple of us that are doing it. It's it's a whole team. Excellent, excellent stuff. Everybody, let's give Dr. Brian Arbogast a great big round of applause real quick for sharing all of that amazing information with us. Wow, what a cool place. All right, it's on my list now. It's on my list. Maybe one day I'll get there. Uh, Brian, are you ready to take some questions from viewers? Yes. Go for it. All right, let's get started. Troy's got several in here, which is perfect. Um, are the camera traps motion activated? Excellent question. Yes, they are. Uh, they, they typically have an infrared sensor and they detect when an animal walks by them. And the ones we use have a, have a red flash so they don't blind the animals or kind of make them sensitive to the cameras. 
it's sort of a, a red glowing flash. That's the ones that we use. A little Great little night question. vision flash. Yes. Yeah. All right. Next one here. Okay. Uh, um, I think I can say this word right. What is an agouti? Yes. So an agouti is, is a type of rodent that is uh, fairly common in the, generally more in the rainforest throughout South America, the Amazon. Uh, most of them, the ones I'm familiar with are black. They have kind of long legs um, and they're fairly good sized. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, have much longer legs and are bigger in body size than something like a guinea pig. Um, I don't have any pictures of any, unfortunately, but they are uh, a member of the rodent uh, group. There you go, Troy. All right, here. Next question is a good one from Lisa. What explains the Andean species in the mid cloud forests? And then she writes, it would be great to do some work on the neighboring volcanoes, along with some genetic analysis. Thoughts? Yes. So, so probably when, when the climate was colder, there was a connection between Samaco and the Andes and the distribution of some of these Andean species was more continuous uh, throughout lower elevations and onto the different uh, volcanoes. And so what we see at Samaco are these sort of remnants of uh, past distribution where spectacled bears and mountain tapirs would have been more widespread and at lower elevation because it was colder and the cloud force would have been at lower elevation. And we, we are very interested in doing some genetic work to look at, um, you know, genetic diversity uh, of populations on Samaco, but also maybe how they compare to other volcanoes, how they're related. Also, it could help us identify perhaps what this mystery cat is. We have put out some hair snares uh, that um, it's been a number of years ago now since we tried them that have wire brushes and some scent that we were hoping the cats would rub their cheek against and we would get uh, some hairs coming off and we could get the hair for analysis. And we definitely, the cats were definitely interested in it, but uh, the problem is, is that you need to check those sort of every day to get the hair samples because it's so wet. And typically we just didn't, it's such, because it's, you know, a couple day hike to get up to the spots. Um, it made it very challenging to check the hair snares often enough to get good samples, but it's something we're very much interested in. Um, in fact, I, I, I can show you real quickly um, since that's such a good question here. Um, yeah. I have a quick video on here, I think, of a, a puma at one of these trial hair snares that we that we uh, had out a number of years ago. Oh, try the share again. I think it dropped. I don't know why it does that. Um, yeah, it seems to take twice. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what what's going on with the. Are you seeing it? Are you seeing there it we now? go. Yeah. So this cat is definitely interested. This puma, and uh, we use. Uh, a variety of scents like bobcat lure and so on. And uh, we, we got them coming to the traps, um, but we didn't really get good hair samples. Um, and this is a, what a spectacled bear does to the, the traps. This also was a problem. 
Uh, let me show you this. Uh oh. Yeah. This one had a uh, chicken behind this this uh, plastic barrier. And the idea is that the animals would, like the cats, would reach up into it. And there were wire brushes there to collect hair if they put their arm up in there. But the spectacle bears would come and just dismantle the system and get the chicken and leave. <laughs> and so that became a problem. Um, so they're kind of like our black bears. They learn really quickly and they will, uh, yeah. they will take advantage of that and, and they can become kind of a nuisance when it comes to actually, actually uh, um, trying to do these kind of studies, but it's a really good question. Yeah, I was about to say, I think I've seen that behavior in bears before, not too far from here. So I guess, F food is food if you're a bear living in the forest, right? And, All right, let's the, see here. Uh, good. Go ahead. I was going to say that one, one kind of humorous one was that we had a, a bear that, you know, scored and, and got a piece of chicken one day. And then the next day was right back at the same spot, sitting in the rain on the camera for a long time. I think expecting this chicken to magically show up again. And it was really kind of comical. I felt bad for him because you could see he was just drenched <laughs> and he was just going to sit by this tree that magically the day before had chicken in it, you know? So <laughs> you, get, you get some, you get some fun things that you just, see too on cameras. Oh, uh, that's, that's great. See people, that's why they tell you don't feed the bears in the national parks unless you're a permitted wildlife biologist. Okay, Ashley's got a great question here. Really like this one. What's in your backpack? Right now? Or when I work? I'm, I'm going to assume when you're making your way up Sumaco Volcano. Okay. So um, basically a lot of traps and the things that go with them, like the, uh, you'd have to have the, the, the cords that attach them to the tree and lock, a lot of that stuff. Um, rain gear, you're always wearing rubber boots um, anywhere around there, uh, but it's mostly the camera trap gear, um, GPS, those kinds of things. But when, when the graduate students and, and other field assistants go up on these mega hikes up into the cloud forest, they also uh, take porters to take food and cook for them because they stay at shelters up there. So, uh, but most of, most of what you're, you know, you have in there is equipment and rain gear and probably some snacks to try to keep your metabolism uh, at bay because you're, you're uh, working so hard. Yeah, that's gonna be, that's gonna be using up a lot, of, a lot of energy. All right, another one here for you. Is the number of wildcats abnormally higher in wild Sumaco than other places in the world? That's a really good question. I think it's, it's pretty unusual for to have as many at actually at Wild Samaco as we do. There's I guess five at just the Wild Samaco Reserve that we've documented. That's pretty high because it's the reserves, you know, a thousand to fifteen hundred acres, sort of on that kind of a scale, um, and so. Uh, to have documented five coexisting like that is 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 high in a small area. Um, and then you add, you know, potentially one or two, and and maybe even more higher up. Um, it, it it gets to be very high for the New World tr 
topics, that's for sure. Excellent. And then one from my moderator on YouTube. Hey, moderator. What is driving the Amazonian species farther up the mountains? And what are the ramifications to the existing environment if they continue to migrate up? Well, those are two great questions. We, we don't know what's driving this uh, because we don't know for sure how long they've been doing this, uh, that they've been, been occurring, that the Amazonian species have been occurring up at the higher elevations. We don't know if this is a recent phenomenon that may have happened in the last 50 years, for example, or if it's something that has you know, been going on for 500 or, or 5,000 years. Um, climates change, the vegetation changes, and that uh, connection with the Amazon due to the location of the Samaco, you know, periodically is going to make corridors that at least make it possible for the Amazonian species to potentially move up. Um, it still surprises me that some of them are as high up as they are. And um, one of the things that our studies will do is set a baseline so that we, if someone's looking at them in 20 years or 50 years, they'll be able to see how these elevational changes might have, might, might have you know, changed in, in that amount of time. We can't go back in a time machine really and tell what it was like 500 years ago or 50 years ago. We have to start somewhere and at least we're making a profile of what it's like in the early 21st century. The ramifications could be tough if the Amazonian species are able to compete for resources competitively with the cloud forest species or even outcompete them, that's gonna have not good ramifications for the cloud forest species. So it's definitely something on our radar that's kind of like, this is not just interesting, but it could have some very important conservation implications that we're, we're just now sort of seeing the pattern and trying to understand its causes and its implications are sort of the next step. Excellent stuff. Brilliant. I mean, really cool work. It's amazing to see the, the diversity of wildlife that's there, um, but also I mean, just so many variables and factors coming together to create such a unique place. So Brian, thanks for being on the show tonight and, and sharing all of that with us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And, and one thing I'll say is that you can go to Wild Samaco, um, maybe not right this minute, but soon. And uh, the, the Wild Samaco Lodge is a great, great place to visit. You can, you can be right in the middle of all this um, and uh, you know, have that opportunity to see it firsthand. So if, you know, for, for the people that are watching that are, like to travel and are adventurous and like wildlife, uh, check it out. You know, the, you know, do a Google and look for Wild Samaco and check out the lodge and the biological station. And uh, uh, you know, maybe you'll end up being down there and maybe we'll run into you down there. There you go. Sounds perfect, everybody. Put it on your bucket list. Brian, again, thanks for being on the program tonight. Thanks for sharing with us, sharing your stories, uh, and uh, for just enlightening all of us to, to some of these really amazing animals, too. Very much appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, I love to talk about this stuff. It's just, it, it, just uh, it still amazes me after all this time. So thank you for having me. And one day soon, we'll have you in person in the museum where you do the presentation on one of the big screens instead of everybody's tiny screens right now. Hey, folks, thanks for tuning in to tonight's edition of Science Tonight. So glad that you joined us. Make sure that you tell a friend, 
family, coworker, colleague, enemy, all the same to me. But share the show with somebody that you know. If you enjoyed this program, listen, we do this every Thursday night, 7 o'clock Eastern, right here at the museum's YouTube and Facebook pages. We meet interesting people making interesting discoveries, chat with them, learn all about it, and try to have a good time doing it. So I hope that I'll see you all again here next Thursday night for another great program. Uh, if you're kind of into physics, next week's program, we'll be talking, I'll be talking with Sam Flynn all about the latest uh, anti-discovery in physics, which is the muon G-factor experiment that maybe has turned our standard understanding, our normal understanding of physics upside down just a little bit. He's a physics uh, particle physics researcher at NC State. So next Thursday night's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be talking about the thrilling discovery of failed predictions and what this new experiment could mean for physics. It's going to be great. Don't miss it. Make sure you're following the museum on all the social media platforms. Subscribe to the YouTube channel here. Of course, you can click the bell to get notified when we go live with new stuff. That way you can come and join us and get that notification. I hope that you'll do that, and I hope that I'll see you again real soon. Take care. Stay safe. Keep your community safe. We'll see you again next time. Good night, everybody.